bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, powered by FanDuel. College football week, well, whatever the hell it is, we're not quite sure anymore. We're not quite sure which games are going to get played, but that's not going to stop us around these parts. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined, as always, by my esteemed colleague and co-host, the one, the only, Payne Insider. And Payne, a happy Veterans Day to you and any of your families that spent time in our military services. Hopefully all of our loyal listeners out there uh, know we always owe them a debt of gratitude without question it's the only reason we're able to do these podcasts and sit around here and talk football so thank you for your service appreciate it and despite you trying to fight it this is college football week 11 week 11 but you know what we're going to spend this entire podcast talking about golf to throw our loyal listeners for a curveball right it's going to be a full comprehensive breakdown of the masters since you're an expert in all things uh, on the links i am not no and we are not. Well, no, that's kind of disappointing. <laughs> then I, don't, I guess I could throw out all the notes that I had prepared to talk a little golf, but yeah, we hey. can get out of dodge. That's it. <laughs> that's it. Shortest podcast in bet the board history. Ninety seconds introduction. Thank our veterans on Veterans Day and shut things down to try and figure it all out. But no, college football. We haven't figured out why you're so against calling this college football week 11. I just don't know what week it is. It's hard for me to keep track of this. I don't know if it's week three, it's week 11. You know, it's all that different nomenclature stuff. Do I go off of the Big Ten? It's only their, what, third week? So I can say it's week three. It's week two for the Pac-12. It's hard for me to wrap my puny little brain around what week it is overall. It's the starting point. And when everyone else wanted to join, they're just along for the ride. That's, you got to go from the starting point. It's very this is week fair. 11. Although, it feels like there's going to be 37 weeks this year, <laughs> Well, though. that's what I'm saying. I'm not quite sure when the season will actually finish. And, you know, there was a point earlier this week that we thought it might have been the ending point for the SEC. So. <laughs> well, this is, this is the interesting part about this. And I know we talked about it at the onset of the season. But we're starting to get to that point where we're certainly going to continue to have a season. But the amount of games that we might have could continue to dwindle here because some of these teams are simply not going to want to play. And teams that are effectively out of it, it's going to be a little more difficult to get those guys to buy in to following some of these protocols. The third stringer or the guy that is moving on after the season. It would be difficult to get those guys to buy into the protocol I think that's certain is you know kind of what we're starting to see here a little bit. I heard there's a Halloween party you're familiar with. Uh, apparently, ha- on at LSU. Apparently, Halloween parties were rampant throughout the SEC, and that's part of what's contributing to uh, some of our dilemmas that we're running into in terms of postponed games this week, no contest, and we'll figure out ultimately if these games get rescheduled. Uh, but I can say from a comprehensive standpoint, Payne, there are certain programs that might benefit by not playing some of these games. Uh, in terms of the big picture and the way it pertains to their uncertain recruiting futures. Smart for LSU to take this game off. We saw Wisconsin punt a couple times, and I am praying Mike Norvell and Florida State somehow finagle their way out of the Clemson game. And by no means are we encouraging, obviously, anybody to go out there and contract the virus. But, you know, you just fabricate a little paperwork if you're Florida State and say, hey, we don't have enough players. We're not ready to play Clemson. Uh, We're just going to take the L as far as a, uh, we'll call it a forfeit, no contact. I'm not even sure what terminology they're using. Uh, But either way, Uh, go ahead. I'm not sure either. I'm not sure either. We got games, at least theoretically. We're going to do things a bit differently today. Uh, So for all of you, our loyal listeners that have been with us, that have grown accustomed to the uh, deep dives and the more comprehensive breakdowns, not quite the show you're going to get today, but we'll also cover a little bit more of the landscape as a result uh, as we try and hit on some of the most interesting matchups that you'll see played this weekend. Uh, Before we do that, though, Payne, uh, a little bit of reshuffling in terms of the top 10. Obviously, you see Clemson take a slight dip. Notre Dame 
gets bumped up a notch with that 47-40 victory against the Tigers in South Bend. Uh, And then you see a little bit of reorganization between teams 5 through 10. Yes, we moved Alabama ahead of Clemson. Not a drastic move, obviously. So nothing to write home there. I was a little concerned. It was good to see Ian Book attack that Clemson secondary, decided to push the ball a little bit further down the field, something we had been hinting at for a few weeks. I know we discussed it in the Pittsburgh breakdown again last week that the passing game may open up a little bit. Sure enough, it did. I think Ian Book possibly played his best game for the Notre Dame Fighting Irish in his career at this point. Move Florida up a couple spots, obviously beating Georgia. Huge win there. Oklahoma quietly getting back on track. Two of the best coaches in college football have seemed to figure it out in Alex Grinch uh, and company there. BYU, impressive win on Thursday evening, or was it Friday evening? Friday, Not sure I which believe that was. game was. There you go. So we moved them up a little bit. Got the performance from Zach Wilson that I think a lot of people were looking for against, you know, I think a down Boise team, and then obviously Sears gets injured with the concussion early in that game. Wisconsin, we moved a few spots back. Cincinnati remains in the top 10. So nothing too crazy, as you alluded to, just some reshuffling of the bet the board top 10. Yeah, and BYU, I don't believe, plays another football game until November 21st, and they'll take on the college football juggernaut known as North Alabama, and then they'll wrap up their regular season in December against San Diego State. So that may have been the last chance for BYU to leave the committee, so to speak, with a lasting impression. I'm not quite sure it'll be enough, but we'll see what transpires uh, over the next couple weeks in terms of the college football playoff. Same thing for Cincinnati. You go out there, you win by four touchdowns, you hold a couple of good offenses in check, and somehow you actually slip in the polls. So we'll see if uh, little brother can get his seat at the table when it matters most. Uh, But on to some of the games this weekend, Payne. And we may as well start with one of the three games scheduled to take place in the SEC. Uh, And that, of course, will be in Gainesville, where the Florida Gators will welcome in one of their former colleagues, so to speak, in Felipe Franks. It's Florida, a 17.5 point favorite. Total in the game, 62.5 at FanDuel. Uh, And I guess, Payne, you look at Arkansas. We know Sam Pittman won't be available. Arkansas is head coach uh, dealing with COVID, so he's been in isolation. We're not quite sure what kind of lasting impact it'll have on the team. Barry Odom, the former head coach of Missouri, set to take over in the interim. Uh, But it is Felipe Franks leading a team in Arkansas who's arguably the biggest surprise in the entire SEC this year, not just from a straight-up perspective where they have three league wins, uh, but also from a point spread perspective where they remain unblemished, 6-0 against the number. I think that's probably the best place to start because I think there's only so much you can do to contain Dan Mullen, Kyle Trask, and, and Florida's offense. And maybe Arkansas gets a little lucky on that side of the ball if Kyle Pitts misses with a concussion. And I think you you kind of hit it. Barry Odom's defense uh, has been surprisingly good. 10th in EPA pass defense. You face Ole Miss. You pick off Matt Corral six times. You mentioned the added pressure for Barry Odom, though. He is going to be responsible for taking over as head coach with Sam Pittman testing positive there. He's had some nice results with his Missouri team against Florida in the past. But for me, again, this is probably all about Felipe Franks. He gets the big return to the Swamp gets to take on his old team I think there's probably some opportunity (laughs) against Florida's defense and I think when you look at the overall landscape of what Franks has brought to Arkansas it's been a pleasant surprise there's still not a ton of talent on that side of the ball Uh, the kid Traylon Burks seems to be pretty good the metrics look good I've watched Arkansas play a few games he seems to be the breakout guy there but I I think Arkansas has one of the best offensive minds and Kendall Bryles, who I'm pretty familiar with. And what I saw Bryles do last year with Florida State seems to be what he's doing with Arkansas. I think Bryles understands that tempo is important to gain an edge because there isn't a ton of talent right now. Arkansas has a poor offensive line exactly like Florida State had last season. If you look so far, Arkansas 101st in sack rate allowed, 81st in line yards. So To me, the key here is if Arkansas can pick up a few first downs and then go tempo, which Bryles does to effectively, you know, protect his offense, it's not going to allow Florida's defensive line to substitute the big guys up front. That's when the fatigue sets in, and then your poor O-line is blocking tired guys effectively, and, and that edge for the defense shrinks a little bit. But 
you know, going back, I, I think this game is is completely on Felipe Franks. Get the ball out on time. Take what Florida's defense gives you. I started to watch a little bit of the Tennessee game last week, and you noticed Franks holds on to the ball a little bit too much. And you read some articles, you look at some of the metrics, and that's what it says. This is the spot where that that three yard dump off is better than taking a sack, and that's really the downfall that Franks has had this season. It's why it hasn't been like this completely like banner season. When Franks releases the ball on time, he's completing 24% more of his throws than when he holds it more than two and a half seconds. When Franks holds it for two and a half seconds or more, he's been sacked 19 times, fumbled seven times in six games. But when he's kept clean, when he's getting the ball out on time, 86% adjusted completion percentage. Only Justin Fields, Mac Jones, and Peyton Ramsey are better among qualifying quarterbacks than Felipe Franks. So Franks, obviously, if he gets it out early, he's going to be kept clean. That, that seems pretty uh, pretty obvious. The other thing that you know getting the ball out on time does is it doesn't allow Todd Grantham, I don't think, to bring as much pressure. Or when he does, you probably have some advantages there. That's the other spot where Franks hasn't been the best. He's been a little bit of a different quarterback. 56 passer rating under pressure, completing 37% of his passes sacked 20 times under pressure but if Arkansas can get to the tempo and Franks gets it out on time and doesn't hold it I think Arkansas is going to score some points here obviously this isn't the best spot for Florida and I think if Franks does those things Todd Arkansas has a chance to stay within this number Florida on the other side paying Kyle Pitts uh, he was on the wrong end of what I would probably call a dirty hit uh, from Luisine, the safety for Georgia. Con- concussion, you're talking about him potentially being a game time decision. It was interesting. Dan Mullen, not known for issuing injury updates, pretty much hit on that on Monday or Tuesday, which leads me to believe that it might be slightly more serious than they want to let on. When you look at this yep. particular number at 17 and a half, do you think that has pits built into it? Or do you think if he officially gets ruled out, we start to see uh, some money come in on Arkansas? I think we'll probably start to see some money come in on Arkansas if Kyle Pitts is announced out, especially with with this spot here. This isn't a game where Florida needs to go out and win by a bunch. And I'm not saying that they wouldn't run it up, but there's a good relationship there with Felipe Franks, the coaching staff. A lot of the players absolutely love him still. So you do have that going for you. But Pitts is just, that's the thing that, that makes that offense go. He is the matchup advantage that no one can cover. You've seen Kyle Pitts get lined up outside, too big for corners. You've seen him moved into the slot, too fast for linebackers and safeties. So that's a massive loss if he's not there because it leaves you with Kadarius Toney, who's basically, in my mind, a little bit of a gadget guy. And that's it. And the one thing, again, I was stunned to see how well Arkansas's defense has played this season, especially against the past 10th in EPA pass defense. So that side of the ball has been pretty feisty. If Pitts is out, it's a huge loss. And I think this number effectively comes back down to where it opened at at 16 and a half. We're already starting to see a little bit this morning, Todd, the hooks starting to disappear on the 17. You know, it's interesting. You talk about Arkansas and their defense. They've been very good against the pass where they've struggled is against the run. And we know that hasn't exactly been in Florida's DNA. So we'll see if Dan Mullen goes out there, tries to run the ball a little bit more, or if it's what we always talk about, you know, a tiger doesn't change its stripes. You throw into the strength of the Arkansas defense, proving you're better in that regard. You look at Florida and what they have to deal with the remainder of the way. You can make the case that this theoretically might be one of their more difficult games. After this, they'll go to Vanderbilt to take on Kentucky at home. They'll go to Knoxville to take on Tennessee on Saturday, December 5th, and they'll close up all things status quo with LSU at home, obviously an inside track to winning the SEC East, potentially setting up that showdown against Alabama and maybe a college football playoff berth on the line for the Gators. A team, though, Payne, that has an inside track should they win out to the college football playoff would be the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. You knock off a number one team in their own building for the first time since the late 80s. And you're looking at Notre Dame taking a little bit of that prosperity on the road to Chestnut Hill to take on Boston College. The Irish, a 13.5 point favorite. Total on the game, 49.5 at FanDuel. And the last time we saw Notre Dame knock off a number one team, well, they followed it up with a home loss against a Glenn Foley-led Boston College Eagles team. 
way back in the day. You look at BC, this is a program that's thrived as a dog. 12-5 and five against the number the last 17 times they've caught points. But meetings against Notre Dame have not been all that friendly. Brian Kelly's bunch beat up on BC 40-7 to seven last year. And the last two meetings, Notre Dame has outscored Boston College 89-27. to 27. A far cry from the three before that, where two of those three were decided by a field goal or less. Payne, so many storylines to try and attack here. The letdown for Notre Dame. Phil Yurkovich, the Notre Dame transfer, leaves to head up BC with a first-year head coach. Not sure what you feel is the most important element when you're breaking down this particular game. I think the fun one in the storyline is certainly Yurkovich, you know. And this will be, obviously, back-to-back games where we're breaking down a quarterback that's transferred going against his old team, which is which is fun, and there's some narrative-based stuff in there. But it's it's clear Yurkovich wasn't Brian Kelly's guy. You know, once that former Notre Dame OC Mike Denbrock recruited him and then left, he was never going to be part of Brian Kelly's plan. So this feels much different than the Felipe Franks thing, right, where he was actually, like, truly loved by some of his teammates. There's more contention here. And if you listen to Brian Kelly's press conference, he's danced around some of the questions. He's never really given glowing praise, I would say, to, to, to Yurkovich this week. So to me, you know he's had this game circled. It's going to be on his shoulders along with Zay Flowers. When you're a 14-point dog, we talk about this all the time, you need to go in with a high-variance game plan. And I think the key to this one is, is pulling off some explosive plays to cover this number or maybe even pull off the upset. And this isn't going to be a surprise to anyone because we've broken down Notre Dame, I think, three times this season. And the one area we constantly focus on is the area of the defense that can be exposed, and it's over the top. The chunk pass, the the explosive pass. Notre Dame right now has given up 22 passes of 20 or more yards this season. Prior to last week's Clemson game, the Irish defense faced one offense, one, that was ranked top 40 in passing efficiency in Louisville. And, you know, that game, I think if we we discussed it and went back, it was 25-mile-per-hour wins there, Todd. So they weren't really tested in that game either. And, you know, I know DJ is on another planet and significantly better than Yurkovich, but this, that was his first road start ever. Clemson hits 11 plays through the air, 15 or more yards. And I think, you, you know, give all the credit to Notre Dame last week, biggest win under Brian Kelly, I would say, and, and certainly probably their biggest since upsetting Florida State in 1993. But Clemson's offensive coordinator, Tony Elliott, lost that game. Like, DJ should have thrown the ball 60 times, at least. Clemson averaged 9.3 yards per pass play, 1.5 yards per per rush. So it it didn't make any sense, that game plan, especially as things went on. You saw NTN wasn't very good running the ball. Notre Dame's defensive line just ate up Clemson's offensive line. They tried getting NTN the ball out of the backfield a little bit more in the second half as a pass catcher. But you should have had that game opened up, and I think – when you fast forward to this game a little bit, you look at Yurkovich and Boston College passing attack, almost 18% of Yurkovich's passes are 20 or more yards. Among Power 5 quarterbacks, Yurkovich is 11th in deep completion, 7th in deep touchdown passes. Boston College has to test Notre Dame deep early often. I, I think, Todd, when we're looking at this, you kind of hinted Notre Dame could be a little sleepy early. If you can somehow hit an explosive or two out of the gates and build that lead... That's how you can pull off an upset in this game. You know, it's interesting because when you look at Notre Dame this season, we saw them with a sleepy effort, so to speak, uh, on the road against Georgia Tech. Again, they dominated on the stat sheet but weren't able to get outside the number. I think the final, I don't have it in front of me, 31-13. They closed the 20-point favorite, so coming up just short. We know the Irish have a big date looming uh, against North Carolina to go a long way. First time this team has played in a conference and could very much have a revenge date, so to speak, on their calendar against Clemson. Revenge, of course, working in the Tigers' favor. So you do wonder what you're going to get from a level of focus here. And as you mentioned, I think we'll see pretty early on exactly what these two teams have in store. Boston College needing to be aggressive and Notre Dame needing to stay true to their colors, uh, establishing the ground game, leading on what should be a matchup advantage on the offensive and defensive lines. From that particular game in the ACC, Payne, ready to head to uh, Old Blacksburg where Virginia Tech welcomes in Miami, and it's Virginia Tech, a a one-and-a-half point favorite. Total in the game, 67-and-a-half. I guess the biggest question, Payne, when you look at this particular game, De'Ara King puts together uh, arguably his best performance against NC State last Friday night. In the last two games, he's thrown for 752 yards, 430 of those coming against NC State. Six touchdown passes to no picks over that time frame. 
He's shown his versatility and his ability as a runner. Virginia Tech, well, they've struggled mobile quarterbacks, but when you look at Virginia Tech, the strength of this team has been their ground game, and they could be down their leading horse, very much like they had to deal with last weekend against Liberty. Yeah, I think that's probably the right place to attack because I think Miami's offense is in a little bit of a groove right now. And you hit on Derek King. He's playing fantastic. He's starting to get used to this offense. And the one spot where there were some question marks initially was about the receiver group for Miami. And they were called out a few weeks back. And I'm not sure the Hokies defense can improve all that much with the talent they have. So, you know, I I think the biggest thing here is we kind of identified this last night when we were speaking is actually Virginia Tech's ability to keep up. You know, I think Tech has to control this game with their offense, and maybe that helps their defense. You have to be able to dictate pace, tempo with the ground game if you're Tech. And I think if you go back the last few times we've previewed Miami's, Miami games, you know, I've kind of hinted, I've, I've consistently said that the Hurricanes defense isn't what people think it is. And the way they're playing, you know, kind of lets you know Manny Diaz believes the same thing. I had heard coming into the season – that Diaz wasn't sold on a secondary, so he wasn't going to be as aggressive defensively with, with blitzing and, and sending pressure. Maybe that changes this game if he doesn't respect Hendon Hooker as a passer, but we're now seven games into the season, so we have some data on Miami's defense, and, and there appears to be, to my eyes and within the metrics, some other concerns, and some of those concerns could be a problem if Virginia Tech is healthy, as you kind of alluded to there, and, and plays well. What we know coming into the season was Miami's D-line was, was going to be elite. And, and sure, I think guys like Silvera and, and Phillips and, and Roche have been fantastic. But past those guys, there hasn't been much help right with that defensive line. They rotate a bunch of guys. There's really not a ton of depth right now for Miami along the defensive line. And coming into the season for Virginia Tech, 10 offensive linemen had a you know starting experience. I think the Hokies O-line was probably the strength of the offense. And so far, we're seeing that. Right now, Virginia Tech fifth in the entire country in standard down line yards. The Hokies O-line has allowed Virginia Tech to this point to be fourth in early down rushing EPA. So basically, when defenses are most prepared to stop the run, Vatek's still been able to run. Overall, the Hokies are eighth in rushing EPA. If you look at Miami, their defense, 47th in standard down line yards, 79th in early down rushing EPA allowed, 76th in EPA per rush overall. And you hit this at the top. The one guy that we need to, you know, need to keep tabs on here, Todd, is Khalil Herbert. He has been a lightning bolt, basically. He's been the second most valuable running back in the country in terms of total EBA. Uh, Herbert right now leads the country 8.4 yards a carry, 5.7 yards per carry after contact. Both of those are number one in the country. Just a, a ridiculous season from, from the Kansas transfer there. But you mentioned this. I think it was the first play where Herbert tweaked his hamstring on the opening kickoff of the Liberty game, didn't return. We're going to have to monitor that, obviously. If Herbert's not 100%, it, it, you basically are going to rely on Hendon Hooker, Raheem Blackshear. I, I know it's old school, but I, I think the Hokies have to be able to run the ball in this game. If they can't, I think they're going to be in trouble, but but this is far and away the biggest factor for me, Todd. When you look at this number, Payne, what does that tell you about the way this game could potentially play out. I mean, we've seen Virginia Tech now. It's been bet down from two and a half where they were at the peak to one and a half. You've also seen money come in on the total, 62 and a half up to 67 and a half. So the first thing when we saw this come out, Todd, we're like, yeah, line says Virginia Tech rolls here. And then it got to three at some places, and I saw some sharp money come in on Miami. Obviously, Miami had 11 guys miss the NC State game, one of them, Brevin Jordan, hasn't played in a few weeks. We'll see what his status is. I'm not 100% certain, but I would think Miami gets potentially a couple guys back here. The line says Virginia Tech. The matchup, if Virginia Tech is healthy, isn't bad offensively. But, you know, you're, you're we're kind of, when we phrased this game was, Miami is going to be able to do pretty much what they want offensively. And if Virginia Tech can run the ball here, they're going to have success offensively as well. So it makes sense that this game to this point has been hit over, but we'll have to monitor Herbert because I think that changes both the total and the side here for sure. You know, always interesting. We talked about Miami's opponent last week, and it's not a game we'll preview. Uh, That team actually taking some money in the market as we see NC State moving up through the seven. 
playing host to Florida State. And breaking news, yet another game in the SEC postponed. Georgia, Missouri officially off the books this coming Saturday. All right, let's move on to games that will, again, be played. And let's head to the Big Ten, Payne. Uh, Wisconsin. We're, we're navigating this well. I know it's frustrating, but at least we have football. We don't have any of the marquee matchups this week. There isn't a single uh, game where we have two ranked opponents, but we're trying to navigate this the best we can. So we initially had seven games that we were going to do, not deep dives on, and then Alabama got nicked. So we, we got six games, and I think we're doing okay. Just kind of navigating this the best we can. We knew it wasn't going to be a normal season, and at least we have some football to talk about. For sure, and we do need the gambling gods to smile upon us, so a best bet doesn't get postponed. Uh, I know some of our loyal listeners out there <laughs> were a little bit frustrated uh, for the second time in, what, about four weeks that we had to have a college football game shelved. Hey, we're doing the best we can, as I know you guys are out there, so appreciate everybody bearing with us. Uh, before we get into the next three games we have, remember, you can follow Payne on Twitter, at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Most importantly, you should follow the podcast at bet the board pod and pain as some teams go into covid protocols one team coming out of it uh this coming saturday would be the wisconsin badgers and they go on the road to the big house as now four and a half point favorites at FanDuel. total on the game 53 and a half when you look at the wolverines they've owned this series a 51 16 and one lead all time and have a 24 and six overall record in games played at michigan stadium michigan will enter a game for the first time since 2017 where they're actually unranked on the heels of their 38-21 loss against Indiana. Uh, and I guess there's a couple of ways that you can look at this game, Payne. One, you begin to wonder if Michigan now sees this as a lost season. Uh, it's probably not a fair way to judge their kids who are still going to go out there and fight, most likely. Uh, but also trying to va- evaluate Wisconsin. We've seen them once. It was a dominant performance to kick things off. But since their 45-7 win against Illinois, we haven't seen much uh, of Illinois' pass defense to be excited about, and it suddenly raises a red flag. Was Graham Mertz that good, or was Illinois' defense that night that bad? It's a great question. And you you mentioned, obviously, Wisconsin hasn't played in a couple weeks. And I think that's probably the important part of this game and where we should start because the players that tested positive on October 24th can continue participating in practice on day 19 of 21 of that timeline the Big Ten has put in place. So today is day 19, Todd, for some of these Wisconsin players. So I think we'll know a little bit more this afternoon after practicing how things went. Players have to go through this you know, series of workouts of increasing intensity is what they're calling it, to be cleared by a cardiologist as I read this Big Ten guideline right now for the return. And I think a lot of people will know this, right? If you watch Clemson Notre Dame last Saturday night and you're wondering, like, how can Trevor Lawrence travel and, and be on the sidelines but not play? It's because of this cardio test the players are put through. So you have to pass that. So it sounds like to me, Todd, at the very least, there's going to be some of these 30 players and staff members for Wisconsin that are back, but I'm not sure a lot of them are going to be, and that's going to be the question and where this line potentially heads. Fortunately, though, you hit on this. I think it's looking like the most important player, Graham Mertz, should be back. It looks like Mertz can probably squeeze in a practice or two and play in this game if he passes all the tests. But this is this is a tough task. I mean, Mertz hasn't played in over three weeks. And to me, that's the biggest factor in this game. When you look at Mertz, he had the coming out party week one and potentially how he's going to do against Don Brown's defense that's struggling in the secondary right now. And that's that's putting it nicely. And you know, we talked last week that Indiana and Penix had to pass the football to pull off the upset against Michigan. Sure enough, that's what they did. They were able to do that. I think what we talked about in that breakdown applies here. Don Brown has to realize that he doesn't have the horses at corner to play the style of defense that he wants. Don Brown has wanted his corners to play man, to play press, to win these one-on-one matchups so he can be aggressive and attack the box and opposing quarterbacks. But you look right now, Todd, Michigan is 105th out of 101 teams in EPA pass defense. On early downs, Michigan's 112th in passing EPA defense. At times in both the Michigan State game and the Indiana games, Don Brown has been forced to drop his guys off in coverage to give them a chance. They're just not playing the ball very well right now. I don't know the approach this week. Uh, you're, it's going to be interesting to see what Don Brown decides to do, knowing that that Graham Mertz 
might not be in form. And I do believe there's question marks about Wisconsin's receiver group. They lost a lot of talent, a lot of experience from from that wide receiver group last season. Here's what's a little bit interesting to me, and, and you kind of led me in the right way. We know Mertz was this highly decorated quarterback coming out of high school. He looks to be elite. And if you go back and watch the Illinois game, ton of poise in the pocket. He was accurate. He was going through his progressions, which was the biggest thing for me. You're watching him look left, look center, kind of pan right, then come back across. He was fantastic. 19 for 19 from a clean pocket with a perfect passer rating, five touchdowns. But that's against Illinois' defense. And after three data points right now, Illinois is 120th in the country in EPA, PPA passing defense out of 121 teams. I think we find out a lot about Wisconsin here. I think Mertz is going to have to be the saving grace of this offense. I don't love, and I texted you immediately from uh, <laughs> I know where you're go- that I think night I know where against you're going the Illinois this. game. Yes. <laughs> the Badgers running back room, it was a question mark coming into the season. There doesn't appear to be like a, a Monte Ball or James White or a Melvin Gordon or a Jonathan Taylor type on the roster. When you're handing it off to what appears to be an undersized fullback in Garrett Groshek, I have questions. So it'll be interesting to see here, you know, what the offense looks like for Wisconsin with Mertz basically maybe having one or two practices before this game, possibly some guys out on the offensive side of the ball not being able to to pass the protocol in time for this game. I'm not sure where this line's going to go, Todd. We've seen it creep up a little bit this morning. I would think if Mertz is in, it's going to go up a little bit, might settle back down a little bit if multiple other guys are out. The one thing to note here, Todd, is is Michigan's going to be without one of its best defensive linemen as well, and Aiden Hutchinson. Fractured his leg in the Indiana game. I think that's a significant loss. But overall, this just feels like a price point that we might see some value in Michigan on. I, I just, I don't know what Wisconsin is right now. I mean, somewhere along the way, and, you know, Michigan obviously got overhyped with their dominant performance against Minnesota. But as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, that had more to do with Minnesota's inability to get off the field. Michigan, of course, then follows it up with back-to-back losses. We know that the heat continues uh, to come on Jim Harbaugh for the way he hasn't gotten his team to perform when you lose to an in-state rival. And then, of course, you follow it up with a good Indiana team, uh, but a game you expected a little bit more. Then you look at Michigan's upcoming schedule. You really don't have a chance to prove your mettle uh, after this week at Rutgers, home against Penn State, home against Maryland. Sure, the Penn State game is big, but the Nittany Lions are 0-3. I almost begin to wonder, Payne, we saw it once last year for Michigan. They put together a great game in the rain when a highly ranked Notre Dame team came in there. If they're going to use this as a game to kind of circle the wagons and be its rallying cry, because I'll tell you right now, they ain't beating Ohio State the final week of the regular season. If you don't beat Wisconsin here, you have a realistic chance to go through the season without a single victory against a ranked opponent. Yeah, and I think that's the toughest part of this game is, one, gauging what Wisconsin is because we came into the season again, hey, not really sure what they have at running back, not really sure if the ground game is going to be there. And all of a sudden, Mertz pops, and you're like, wow, this is going to be the calling card of, of Wisconsin's offense. But you know, you kind of have to put an asterisk there based upon what we've seen from Illinois' defense. And now you're getting Michigan at this price point where the market absolutely hates them. You at least have revenge, right? What they lose last year, 35-14, there's at least got to be some buy-in here. We're going to find out which direction Jim Harbaugh's program is going in because if you don't show up for a game like this, not a positive sign. No, I think that's a uh, it's a bigger indictment uh, of anything else. I mean, if they were to completely yep. fall apart in this spot, I think it's a, a more damning portrayal of where Michigan is headed than losing last week against Indiana. I would echo those sentiments completely. And speaking about Indiana... Uh, They'll put their undefeated record on the line, this time in East Lansing, where they take on Michigan State. Indiana, a a 7.5-point favorite at FanDuel. Total in the game, 52.5. Uh, And when you look at Indiana, they've been one of the bigger surprises as far as college football is concerned. You knock off Penn State for the first time in eons. You take care of Michigan as well. And they haven't fallen victim to the moment. We know their schedule only gets more difficult. Maybe not this week, but they do have a massive showdown uh, against Ohio State on deck if they're really going to be considered contenders. And not a game I don't think any of us expect them to win, but we'll see how competitive they can be. Uh, But I do have to ask, Payne, when you look at the Hoosiers uh, and how they've performed this season, you know, average starting field 
field position ha- has been better than their than their own 30. You know, you're looking at how well they're doing scoring in, inside that green zone. What they're doing as far as picking up the available offensive yards, nothing to write home about. Net yards per play metric, nothing stellar by any stretch, or they're actually in the red in that. Uh, how do you begin to assess Indiana and how we should grade them out, not only for this matchup, but how the market kind of feels about them? Winning breeds winning, baby. <laughs> I I think we touched on this last week when I said Indiana's metrics aren't really indicative of what's going on. But last week was their best performance of the season, so we saw the metrics start to even out a little bit. In terms of like net EPA, they were in like 91st heading into the Michigan game. They came out 37th. So... The metrics are starting to get a little bit better. Listen, the talent, the experience is all there on offense for Indiana. So it feels like they're going to be an offense that starts to get a little bit better. I do believe that. Maybe not this week, but I think there's at least some potential there where they'll start to mirror uh, the talent that they have, the metrics that is. For me, when I look at this game specifically to this week, I think the simple but obvious thing here is Michigan State needs to be able to hold on to the ball. Ten turnovers in three games. All ten came against Rutgers and Iowa. And, you know, the one game you don't turn it over, you win as a four-score underdog on the road against an in-state rival. So that's going to be the key to this game, holding on to the ball. Obviously important, but a lot of times unpredictable. So, you know, for me, when I look at this, that's probably the side of the ball that makes the most sense here in this game. The Spartans' defense has to be able to slow Penix and the Hoosiers' offense down. You know, pressure, if you can, when you look at it this way, if you can at least hold Indiana's offense down, it's going to not put pressure on Rocky Lombardi in the offense to perform to a level where they're not accustomed to. You're going to start making mistakes if you are forced to sit back in the pocket with Rocky Lombardi and throw all day. So I think it's crucial that the defense can hold Penix Jr. down a little bit. And Penix is familiar with his environment, right? If you go back to 2019, his very first conference start was at Michigan State. At one point, he completed 20 straight passes. Now, I think for a lot of professional betters, they hope that that's not the case this week. But if you're looking at Sparty's defense this time, I think you got to choke out the ground game. Michigan State has done an okay job of, of stopping run. I would say a couple of their opponents are better running the ball than than what they'll see here with Indiana. But right now, Michigan State 10th in line yards. Top 50 in EPA per rush allowed both on early downs and overall. It's the one spot where Indiana has struggled a little bit offensively, and I think it's throwing some of their metrics off just a little bit. But Indiana hasn't been able to create that push up front offensively. They're 63rd in line yards, 85th in early down EPA per rush as well. So if Sparty can stop the ground game, the next step is, is, is being good, pressuring Penix. If you really look at Indiana's pass offense, it's been fantastic when Penix is kept clean, but for whatever reason, he is struggling right now under pressure, whether it's being slow to process, and you would think that's the case because it surprises me, right? Like Penix can really use his legs, but the dichotomy there of pressured versus kept clean is staggering, and you're typically always going to have better quarterback play when when the quarterback's free in the pocket and, and kept clean, but this dichotomy is massive. If you look, Michael Penix Jr. right now has been pressured on 36% of his dropbacks. He has a 50 passer rating when pressured, zero touchdowns, one interception, completing 42% of his passes when pressured. When he's kept clean, his passer rating is 70 points higher. He's completing 32% more of his throws, seven touchdowns, zero interceptions. So Mel Tucker's defense has stopped the run, then get some pressure. I think you can throw out last week's game completely against Iowa. It was an absolute no-show. In the prior two games uh, against Michigan Rutgers, Michigan State's defense pressured quarterbacks on 39% of dropbacks. I think that will be a fantastic rate this week. If you can do that, I think Sparty probably stays within this number. It's pretty incredible when you think about Indiana and how differently their season 
uh, would have gone potentially from a trajectory standpoint if Penix doesn't get into the end zone in overtime or they're not able to lead that march at the end of regulation against Penn State. Indiana sits here 3-0, and very much in control of their own destiny, obviously, in the Big Ten East. Meanwhile, Penn State continues to flounder, hitting rock bottom last weekend in a game where they closed a 27.5-point favorite at home against the Maryland Terrapins. And like you said at the top, winning breeds winning and a lot of confidence, especially for a program that hasn't experienced this level of prosperity in quite some time. Uh, and you love to see it for the kids, knowing it's a veteran-laden group. We'll see if rubber meets the road this weekend when they travel to East Lansing to take on State. Uh, And last but not least, Payne, because we know you bleed Pac-12 football. We had to talk one game out on the West Coast. And as much as I push to break down my beloved Oregon State Beavers, they didn't make the cut. So we'll start with their most prolific team in the league from an all- Your beloved Oregon State Beavers. When did you start claiming them? Last year I claimed them, but I'm off that bandwagon because my guy's in the NFL continuing to cover numbers. That's right. doesn't matter what jersey he wears. All he does is cover numbers. That's the bottom line with Jake Luton. I, I was hoping that they pulled that game off for the sake of the Dolphins draft pick. Well, I was hoping they pulled that game off for the sake of Survivor along the whole lines of every other big <laughs> underdog that had a chance and fell flat on its face in the waning seconds. We could save that for the NFL show. How ridiculous was that? Yeah. I mean, it, Patriots pulled one out. Pittsburgh pulled one out. I mean, Survivor pools were safe. All three double-digit favorites in the NFL needed to withstand last-second plays to ultimately get the win. So... That's right. drives you absolutely bonkers but you continue to trudge forward and that's probably the best way to describe arizona and where their football team is right now trudging more than anything else usc uh more than a two touchdown favorite 14 and a half at FanDuel. uh as they'll make the journey down to tucson total on the game 67 and a half at FanDuel. uh and Payne, when we look at usc clay helton's seat was pretty hot coming into the season he might have lost his employment status uh, had he dropped a season opener against Arizona State but Keaton Slovis and the special teams for USC erase a late 13 point deficit they slip out of the Coliseum with a 28-27 victory and Slovis for the day finishes 40-55 381 yards including two big touchdowns in the final three minutes Drake London of course coming down with the most important one Uh, and you have to give Slovis credit he showed a little bit of maturity uh, in his season debut didn't take off didn't panic when he didn't have his primary read there kept his eyes trade down the field but defensively same old USC same old Todd Orlando they blew assignments countless times but I'm not sure Arizona has the playmakers to really do a whole lot on that side of the ball but when you're USC and you come into this game Arizona breaking in a new defensive scheme I'm not quite sure of the most effective way to try and go about handicapping it and figuring out where the Trojans may or may not have an edge I wasn't a fan of USC's performance last week especially in the first half. I can't figure out how that game went over in the first half. Don't want to talk about it. Here we are. Don't want to talk about it. (laughs) So, to me, you know, when you're going against Keaton Slovis and your defense is projected to be one of the worst in college football, and then you have three or four defensive starters opt out, it's not going to be pretty. Now, I know Kevin Sumlin brings in this new defensive coordinator, but the cupboard is pretty bare in terms of talent. And the system that Paul Rhodes is trying to run is is going to transition to a more normal defense. You know, they're going to a 3-4 from, I believe, a 4-2-5. You love Marcel Yates. And You've always been a huge Marcel Yates fan, even when he was at Boise <laughs> State. Don't sugarcoat it. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, when you're making that transition, you see why a slew of Arizona starting linebackers transferred out. So, to me, Arizona is going to get gashed in game one against Slovis. So, for me, like, it's going to come down to Arizona's offense being able to try to keep pace to have a chance here. There's a reason this total's leaked out from 64 to 67 and a half. It's going to be on Grant Gunnell in, in the Wildcats offense. I think when you're looking at Arizona as a whole this season, they're probably going to be a little bit more pass happy, you know, without Tate. But in this game, I think Arizona's got to be able to run the ball a little bit, shorten it. That's the key. When when you're the underdog, you want as, as few plays as possible. When you're the favorite, you want as many. But you're looking at eight starters returning on the offensive line. And that maybe gives you an advantage here in the trenches. We know USC last season, when you remove sack yardage, were 104th in the country in yards per rush. USC had a hell of a time trying to contain perimeter runs, Overall, last season, 123rd in rushing success rate defense. And when you fast forward, just one game sample here against a mobile quarterback in Daniels last week for for ASU, 
But once again, like hammered on the ground. It's an undisciplined Trojans defense. They gave up explosives. It's tough when you don't have a large enough sample or a lot of data points. We just have one right now. But USC, 108th in early down EPA per rush allowed, 114th in overall EPA per rush. Grant Gunnell seems to have a solid receiver group. But if you can get the ground game going, suddenly I think it opens up the RPO game and makes throws easier for a young quarterback. And and that's going to be the key in my mind in this game, Todd, because Arizona is not going to get many stops. It's going to be on the offense to keep pace with Keaton Slovis and the USC Trojans offense. Maybe they can do that, shorten the game a little bit with their ground game. Then you get the RPO pass attack off that. You do have some nice weapons outside. But that's the way you're going to potentially stay within a 14 and a half point spread here. It's not going to be anything from your defense. What, what am I setting at the over under at for Arizona defensive stops in this game? Do I make it two and a half and do I heavily juice the under or do I make it one and a half and juice the over? Tough. If I'm betting into it, I'm not sure I'm going to let you know what that number is. It's a good be. point. I may have to take that but, off air then. I don't want you to tip the market before <laughs> I open it up for the masses to fire into it with small limits. There you go. I, I, I've heard back in your day. A lot of people like to fire into you. <laughs> you know what? My days behind the counter uh, were I was severely handcuffed. I felt like I went in every fight with both hands tied behind my back, and I constantly had to bob and weave <laughs> a little bit because, God forbid, we actually took a bet in those Caesars days. Somehow it was my fault if the bet lost, but the boss didn't want to determine the effectiveness of my bookmaking technique until a kid missed a field goal in the waning seconds because, as we all know, that's how you ultimately grade how someone booked a game for the previous five days when it comes to football season. Corporate folks, that Monday morning meeting can't be too pleasant. Yeah, well, trust me, there were plenty of Monday morning emails that would come in And when you have a player that loses six figures consistently, heaven forbid he actually has a winning Sunday that somehow it's a default, you know, it's it's the errors of our ways as bookmakers, but I can put it this way and we won't get into it on too big a tangent. There's a reason that uh, I like to think I'm still have a role in this industry where my former boss is somewhere retired on the South Carolina coastline. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Finally took. Todd coming out of his shell there. And on Veterans Day, no less, he finally takes a shot. He wasn't a veteran of this. He wasn't a veteran of the service. I I don't have to. No, but it's supposed to be a a, a happy day. It's supposed to be a day we celebrate people. It is. I'm not take jabs at people regardless of their profession. I'm celebrating you. First time I've gotten you to take a little shot ski at someone in the I celebrate you. I celebrate myself. I celebrate all of our listeners that have made this (laughs) podcast uh, as popular as it's become. I do not have to celebrate him, but I am forever thankful because who knows, if things actually had worked out, I might still find myself toiling away behind the counter instead of trying to make sports betting a little bit more mainstream like we've seen over the last, what, six to eight years or so. I have to tell you, I woke up feeling good this morning, and now I know why. It's because you celebrated me. I appreciate that, buddy. <laughs> Hold on a second. I didn't say I put you on a pedestal or I cherished you. I celebrate your abilities uh, as a handicapper, as an analyst. As we know, this podcast doesn't work without the two of us bringing our C game more often than not. I appreciate Hold on, I'm gonna that. Pull up the, I got to pull up the board. I got to see if any other games were canceled in the last seven minutes. Christian McCaffrey upgraded, by the way, for you, Payne. Just in case. Uh, really? Just uh, downgraded, excuse me. But, of course, the market. Downgraded. That, <laughs> downgraded, upgraded. Same <laughs> well, thing. you know, if you look at the odd screen, you're not quite sure because I'm not sure anyone believed he was going to play. But if you look at the way the number's moving, apparently somebody did. Um, all right. I, I completely digress uh, in all of those. You've lost your mind today. Yeah, I'm a little bit. I'm a little bit out there. I can't quite put together coherent thoughts. You got a haircut yesterday. Two days ago. I cleaned okay. it up. Two days ago. I thought about going frosted Thank tips. You. It looked a little short. Did you go with the same woman? I, I did. I was on Twitter. I try not to do that these days, but I was on Twitter. Yeah. And then I saw a video and your head came across. I wasn't quite sure it was you initially. And then I did a double take. You, you went different with the with the dude I, this I let time. her try and style it for me, Payne. Sometimes you have to come out of your comfort zone a little bit and uh, try and go with a different look. Can I be candid? Should I go with the frosted tips? Is that what you're going to say? Is that where you're going to go? Go <laughs> Get back into the comfort zone. <laughs> hey, you got to mix it up a little bit. Here and there, you live once. I'm not going with the uh, platinum blonde look, no faux hawk, anything along those lines. But I'm not quite sure I can pull off the spiked hair, so we'll have to style a little bit differently. Do we have anything else we got to do in this podcast? I feel like we should try and give uh, our, our listeners a winner and put our win streak uh, on the line. What are we at? Five games, six games? I can't even keep track anymore. Five games in a row. Hopefully this is six Get to the NFL podcast tomorrow. My favorite number. We'll pull off lucky number seven. There we are. 
bing, bang, boom. This stinks because I would have liked to have broken down the Alabama LSU well, game, well, but that got nixed. Well, let's and be a honest. What were you really going to say? If we had to break down Alabama LSU, what were you really going to say to try and figure out a compelling case? How many passing yards is Mac Jones <laughs> going to throw for against that secondary? Well, it depends how long Nick Saban plays him. If he plays him for three quarters, he could throw for 550. If he pulls him at halftime when the tide's up 24 points, a little bit of a different story. Well, I was interested in that total initially. So our, our listeners know that we love full game overs now after last week. And, uh, yeah, there were a lot of people that were nervous. They thought you'd lost your damn mind giving out a full game over. Man. All right. It's about that time. Six games broken down. Not as deep as we normally do, so you guys have uh, plenty of information to make your choices on some of the marquee games. Uh, but we'll do the heavy lifting here and try and figure out where we're going for our best bet. It's time to right a wrong, Todd, because I don't hold grudges. That, but it's that's a, team a lie. That's... <laughs> strict one and done policy around here uh because i think michigan state has done us wrong in the past but you're gonna go back to the well with sparty rotation number 164 let's go michigan state plus the seven and a half against indiana this week as you kind of alluded to i like indiana more than most but some of the metrics don't align with being a touchdown plus road favorite here against michigan state if we don't turn the ball over, I think we're going to be fine here. We've seen at least Michigan State play to a higher level. I think last week's game, you, you really just throw away. I know they lose their opener to Rutgers, but seven turnovers, and yet you're still in that ball game. We saw the peak against in-state rival Michigan. Mel Tucker saying all the right things this week. He's holding his team accountable. And I think we see a, a good effort. I think we see energy here from Michigan State hosting a top-10 team in Indiana. I mean, let's go with Sparty plus the seven I mean, and a half. Anything else? Well, you I think? mean, our listeners have grown accustomed. They figure with your personality type, you're the one to go back to a jilted lover. If you've been burned multiple times, you're definitely the kind of guy to try and mend the fence, uh, <laughs> let bygones be bygones. So Michigan State makes a lot of sense. One thing I will say about the Spartans, if you do some reading this week, uh, Mel Tucker, some pretty strong comments. Obviously, a first-year head coach trying to change the culture a little bit. Michigan State lands uh, arguably the best defensive line prospect in the entire state. So you'd have to think that's a good sign for the program as well. The name eludes me. Uh, I think it's James, Jamison Barry or something along those lines. I know that was a big story. Talking about national TV, top 10 opponent. Um, and the other thing with Michigan State, the market has had a pretty decent read on them. Last week, notwithstanding, we know they took money against Iowa. Uh, but week one, the money came in on Rutgers. Michigan State turns it over seven times. Michigan State gets absolutely buried week two against Michigan. Uh, and I imagine we're going to see some money uh, on Michigan State this week. I can't imagine the seven and a halfs last uh, up until game day. I like it. Let's go with Sparty plus the seven and a hook. Mel Tucker, get us to the promised land, my friend. Uh, anything else you'd like to share with our loyal listeners before you take a 24-hour hiatus and return right here to talk your beloved National Football League tomorrow? That's it. NFL tomorrow morning. Be there, be square. Do, do you want to share any of the tidbits you uncovered on your Florida State Seminoles as NC State takes yet another wave right now? Poor Mike Norvell. Oof. <laughs> Feel for the guy. He is aged 10 years and 10 months, but this is a complete rebuild. And it'll be fun to see that process. Break it all down before you build it back up. If he needs some advice, he can pick up the phone and call Mike Leach in Starkville. I'm sure the two of them have similar reclamation projects that they're trying to put together. For Pain Insider, you can follow him on Twitter at Pain Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there. Follow the podcast. Most importantly, at Bet the Board Pod. Michigan State, your week 11 best bet. And come Saturday early afternoon, we'll see you at the window. Thanks for listening to Bet the Board. You can catch Todd and Payne every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday during football season, breaking down the biggest NFL and college football games. And to make sure you don't miss any free best bets, subscribe to Bet the Board on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.